tons of techniques that you might encounter in biochemistry, and what technique scientists choose to use depends on things like what questions they're trying to answer, as well as what equipment they have access to. And so here is an overview of some key biochemistry techniques, um, some of the main ones, as well as some more obscure ones that I just happen to know a lot about. Um, and so with each of these, I have posts I will link you to um, for more information. So just a broad overview of what we're going to be going over, and then I will go through and make timestamps and put them in the comments so that you can jump to the parts that you're interested in if you want. So basically, we're going to go over gel electrophoresis, which is a way that we can separate molecules based on size by sending them traveling through a gel. Um, we'll talk about how we can do this for both proteins and nucleic acids, so for like DNA and RNA. Blots, which are going to allow us to detect specific molecules as opposed to just seeing them all. We can test for the presence of specific molecules um, after we do one of those gels. I'll talk about some things to know about working with nucleic acids, so your DNA and your RNA, how we can purify them, how we can label them sequence them, all of these various things. Also talk about how we can measure expression. Um, and so this could mean the how many messenger RNA copies are getting made. So measuring at the level of the transcription, we can use qPCR to measure how many mRNA copies there are. And we can use ribosome footprinting and profiling to see which mRNAs are being actively used by the ribosomes to make proteins. And then we can measure the levels of those proteins using Western blots and mass spec and things like this. So we'll get into those. Also talk about how we can manipulate that expression and manipulate other things that are going on inside of cells um, using techniques like CRISPR and, um, to kind of edit the actual DNA. Or we can, for a permanent effect, um, we can also use tools like recombination, like prelox recombination to do genetic editing kind of on demand. We can use RNA interference to, uh, to mess with just the messenger RNA levels and not the actual protein. So this would be like your knockdown, whereas this could be a knockout or some sort of other editing. We can also uh, manipulate things at the level of the protein, such as using conditional degron tags and protax and other targeted protein degradation tools. Um, we can also measure the interactions that are actually going on inside of cells or inside of purified mixtures. Um, we'll go over some of the techniques we can use to study protein-protein interactions, protein-nucleic acid interactions, um, things like a co-IP, um, EMSA, slot blots, various things like that. A lot of the work that we do in biochemistry, we're doing things where we're kind of like expressing and purifying proteins and then testing how those proteins work and interact with other things. Um, not all, I mean, every biochemistry lab is going to be different and doing different things, but a lot of the work that you're doing often involves some sort of molecular cloning where you're sticking the genetic instructions for making something like a protein into um, a more easily worked with form, like a plasmid, like a circular piece of DNA we can stick in bacteria and get bacteria to make lots of copies of it and make protein from it and things like this. So we'll go into some of the methods that you can use for molecular cloning, such as slick or just traditional restriction digest, as well as then how we select for, um, we stick that into bacteria and then choose the bacteria that actually have it uh, make sure that our cloning actually worked, and things like this. Some other things, um, measuring concentrations of proteins and nucleic acids, as well as just general experimental design considerations. So are you working in a totally in vitro system with, very, with everything being made and purified, and then you mix the components? Um, this is going to give you the most control, but it's also going to be the least physiologically relevant, so the least like it would be in the body. Um, that would be in vivo if you're actually working in the body, and then like you can do things in cell culture, and we'll get into some of the pros and cons of these. No matter what type of experimental system you're working with, you want to make sure you have a good experimental design. Um, so we'll talk about like controls and things like this as well as really plan things out ahead of time and think of, think through things. There are also a lot of more specialized techniques. So structural biology is going to be 
um, a field of biology and biochemistry where we're looking at the structure of molecules. So what do they look like at the atomic level? And how does their structure relate to their function? And so we can use tools like X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM um, and things like this. And I have a whole page on structural biology with, with a bunch of more posts um, if people are interested in more of that. I also have pages on protein expression and purification. Um, we'll get into some of this, how we can um, purify proteins, basically, use, typically using chromatography, so putting them through columns filled with little beads, and then separating them based on how the proteins interact differently with those beads because the proteins all have different properties. I also have a page on mammalian cell culture. Um, so if you're working with mammalian cells, um, things like splitting cells and checking their health, um, various things like this, as well as more practical lab tips and tricks on random, var various random things. And then I have a bunch of playlists on my YouTube channel where you can check out things that might interest you, that you want to know more about. For no matter what type of experiment you're using, you're going to have to, um, in addition to having a good experimental design, you're going to want to be familiar with the things in a lab. Um, so the sorts of equipment, um, pipetting and centrifuging and making, um, making buffers and stock solutions and things like this. Um, and then just a couple of random things that I just happened to, happened to have done before and so I have more knowledge about and so have posts on. So now let's go a little slower and, and go through things, starting with gel electrophoresis. So as I mentioned before, electrophoresis, gel electrophoresis is a way that we can separate molecules by size. And how it works is basically we make this gel mesh, and so we can make this gel mesh out of agarose, um, so this like sugar, or we can make it out of polyacrylamide. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use electricity to send the molecules traveling through this mesh. And the bigger the molecules are, the more tangled up they're going to get in this mesh. And therefore, they're going to travel more slowly. And so when we turn off that electricity that was causing them to move through the gel, they're going to be stuck in place. And in this way, the bigger things are going to be higher up. The smaller things are going to be further down. And then we can use some sort of visualization method in order to see what's where. Um, and so agarose gel, we often use this for big pieces of DNA and RNA. And then when we're talking about page gels, so these polyacrylamide poly gels, we're often using these for proteins as well as small RNA and DNA fragments. And so I have much more content on these sort of things. But basically, these, these gels are just going to allow us to separate the molecules. So a gel is just kind of like this mesh filled with liquid, and we're going to send the molecules through um, using electricity. So they're moving based on electricity, so we call it gel electrophoresis. One of the most common forms you'll probably be using is SDS page. This we're using to, this is a sort of um, denaturing gel that we're using to separate proteins. And by denaturing, what we mean is that the protein is unfolded. And so what we're separating them isn't really their like size, it's more like their length. So proteins have different folded up shapes and they also have different charges. Electrophoresis relies on them all having a negative charge and a charge that's going to be um, proportional to their length. And so how we can achieve this is using SDS, which is a detergent, it's an artificial soap. It's negatively charged, it's going to denature the proteins along with your heat and keep them soluble. So allow them to slither through the gel and since it's negatively charged, it's going to be um, coating all these proteins and hiding any sort of like natural charge they have and giving them this like uniform charge that's directly proportional to their length. And this way you can then separate the proteins based on their size. So that's the basis of SDS page. And this is probably one of the most common techniques that you'll see in any biochemistry lab. If you want to purify a protein to see how pure it is, or if you want and I want to see how like pure it is, how much of it there is, if you want to see how much of a protein there is and stuff like this, we can go to a Western blot and we'll get into that. But that's SDS page. You can also do a native page where you don't use SDS. Um, and this is actually going to keep strong protein protein complexes in place. Um, and so you can detect interactions between molecules sometimes. 
Um, and so this would be a native page if you're not denaturing. And so if proteins are bound together, they're going to run higher than if they were separated. Um, and this can tell you various things. Um, then, okay, so that was, that was with the SVS page and native page. Page is going to have smaller, um, smaller pore sizes than the agarose gel and more consistent pore sizes. The smaller the pore size is, the, um, the smaller the molecules it can separate. So if you have really big pore sizes, all those little molecules are just going to swim right through and not going to separate, like they're not going to be differentiated from one another. But if you have big, um, if you have really small pores, then they can get separated. And so SDS page is going to be better for separating those small, the, so page is going to be better for separating small things, whereas agarose is going to be better for separating big things. And we often use agarose when we're separating like big pieces of DNA, um, such as when we're doing molecular cloning. But sometimes we also you use, we do use page gels for nucleic acids when we're studying shorter pieces of nucleic acids. And again, we can have nature, denaturing and non-denaturing. Um, so for denaturing, we often do like a urea page. This is going to basically unfold the RNA or the DNA, um, separate the strands, things like this, um, by using urea to coat the molecules. And this is going to then allow you to have them slither through the gel. Um, and with just like a normal non-denaturing gel, you can just do like a TBE gel. This is still going to separate your molecules based on their size. They're still going to have that negative charge thanks to the backbone of DNA and RNA, so you don't need to have a negative charge added. Um, but they will not, they will, the secondary structure, so if they have folds, if they have things like this, that will, that will be maintained in just one of those normal gels without urea. Um, and so those were going to be your page gels and then your agarose gels. Also talk about how, like I have a post on how you can make your own page gels or you can buy them pre-made um, and how to like choose the, choose what percentage gel you want to use. When you're running a gel, you might be doing it for a couple of different reasons. You might be doing it for just analytic, for analytical purposes to basically just like see what's there. Or if you want to do it for preparative purposes. So we can actually use page as a purification step when we're doing this gel electrophoresis of nucleic acids. And so we can actually do use like gel extraction to basically cut out the bands and isolate the DNA or the RNA from them. Or what we can do is we can just get a look at them. And if we just wanna get a look at them, what we commonly use is a fluorescent nucleic acid stain, um, something like a lithium bromide or DAPI. Um, often, DAPI is often used like in cells and things like this. Um, we, in, there's like cyber stains and things like this that we can use in order to stain our gel and see where the DNA or the RNA is. If we want to look for proteins, here we, we typically use Comasi. Um, so this is going to be like a blue stain. They have, nowadays they have for, versions that are like quick stain versions that have this like colloidal Comasi. Um, basically, it'll be able to stain um, more fat quickly, and you don't have to use like acid and methanol and all this stuff to actually fix them in place and then wash everything out. Um, and so those colloidal ones are a lot nicer to use and nicer for the environment, too, because you don't have to use a bunch of methanol um, and acid and things like this. With the conventional Comasi Blue, you have to actually fix the gel, so you have to freeze things in place using acid and alcohol. Um, and then you, when you stain it, it stain, like super stains, like the background and everything. Um, and then it's, you have to de-stain it. Um, but with the colloidal form, basically it, less of it goes into the gel. Um, and it kind of gradually goes into the gel so you don't get as high of a background. You can just de-stain it with water really quickly. So colloidal is really nice, like those instant stains. Um, but it's also going to be more expensive. If you need to have really, really, really sensitive detection, um, silver staining is often the, what you turn to. Um, silver staining is going to kind of make silver deposit on where the proteins are located in the gel. It's kind of a pain to run. Um, there's a bunch of different steps. And also it, it's really easy to let it go over and then your whole gel just turns like black. But it is very, very sensitive, but sometimes a little too sensitive.
Um, so that's your silver staining. Those were all going to just show you everything that was there. So it's going to show you all of the different proteins that are present, or it's going to show you all of the nucleic acids that were present. If you're interested in seeing if a specific one is there, if you're interested in a specific protein, um, you're going to be looking for towards a Western blot. Um, and if you want to look for a different type of molecule, like a DNA or an RNA, you're going to be using some other sort of blot. And the blot part, with these, what we're doing basically is we're taking the molecules out of the gel and transferring them to a membrane. Um, this can be something like a nitrocellulose membrane or a PBDF membrane. This is going to be something sturdier that the proteins of the nucleic acids can't just like diffuse off of easily. So we want to stick them onto something sturdier that then we can probe. Um, so we can det we can use molecules to kind of check and see if they um, if they're is that sequence present or if there is that protein present. And so we can use different types of blots depending on what type of molecule we're looking for. In the case of a Western blot, we're often we're using antibodies to detect the, a protein of interest on that membrane. Often what we're using is we use a primary antibody that's going to bind to our protein of interest, and then we have a secondary antibody that's going to bind to that primary antibody. And the secondary antibody is going to allow us to detect it. It's going to have either a fluorophore on it, so it's going to be able to give off light when you shine a certain light at it, or it's going to be conjugated or like attached to an enzyme like HRP, which then when you add a chemical, it will make that chemical turn colored or give off light. Um, and so I have a post on why we use secondary antibodies and things like this. Basically, you get signal amplification and cost savings. Any of these blots are only going to be able to show us what we look for. And so if we don't know to look for something, we won't see it. Um, whereas in the case of one of these all stains, you're seeing everything that's there, but you're not able to identify which what is what. When we're doing a Western blot, we, so we're only probing for that one thing, but often we want to make sure that all the proteins got transferred and kind of get a sense at how much protein was there and things like this. So we often do like a Ponzo stain, which is just a really quick reversible stain that you can do to that membrane before you go ahead and you do your antibody binding. And so I have a post on this as well. That was for the proteins, um, and so with the Western blot, we're looking for proteins using antibodies. There are other types of blots depending on if you want to look for other molecules. So for example, if you want to look for um, RNA, you can use a northern blot, which is going to use DNA that has a sequence that is complementary to the RNA you're looking for, and that DNA sequence is going to be labeled. So if your RNA sequence of interest is present, the DNA is going to bind to it and show you where it is. An Eastern blot is going to use antibodies to look for protein modifications. So similar to a Western blot, except instead of looking just for a protein, you're looking for a sort of modification, something maybe like glycosylation, so the addition of a sugar chain. If you're looking for DNA, you can use a Southern blot. Um, so we'll and look using a DNA probe. And so Southern is the only blot that should actually be capitalized. Southern blot was like the original um, directional blot. Um, and so it was named for a guy whose last name was Southern. And so the Southern should be capitalized, but these others should technically be lowercase, although a lot of people ca do capitalize them. Um, but a Southern blot is looking for DNA using DNA. Um, there's also a bunch of other varieties. So Southwestern is looking for DNA binding proteins using DNA. A far western protein binding proteins using other proteins. Um, a northwestern, which is looking for RNA um, binding proteins using RNA. And then a reverse northern, which looks for DNA using RNA. So lots of different types of blots, depending on what you're looking for and what you're using to look for that thing. So just remember, so a blot is going to show you specific things, but only if you're looking for them. And a um, just a general overall total molecule stain is going to show you everything, but not identify what it is. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about working with nucleic acids. So we already talked a little about how we can use this gel extraction method, um, gel extraction to remove, um, to purify RNA and DNA out of gels when we're running one of those preparative gels. 
So not the analytical where we're just look, getting a look, but an actual preparative one. So we load a lot of sample and we're trying to actually purify it out. So instead of running just a tiny bit of our, um, how much total sample we have, just so we can see it, we're running all of our sample. Um, and then we're cutting it out and extracting it out, so getting it out of the gel. If you're doing this from an agarose gel, it can be a lot easier, especially if you use like a low melting point agarose. You can kind of just melt the gel around to your molecule and get it out more simply. And there are various um, kits and things like this that can make it really easy. When you're doing things from a polyacrylamide gel, this is going to be harder. So remember that those polyacrylamide gels, those are going to have those finer meshes. They're going to be kind of like sturdier. Um, it's going to be harder for things to get out. So what you tip, what the common method is this like crush and soak method where you basically use a razor and you cut around your band and then you crush it um, with a pipette tip. You kind of just like crush it against the walls of the tube. Um, you add some extraction buffer and you freeze it um, and then you let it thaw and this is going to help the molecules kind of diffuse out so just like wander out um, and then you can purify it further from there often based on a precipitation method so you have this RNA or DNA floating around in the solution and then you can add salts and alcohol and try to get it to precipitate out so to come out a solution and then you can wash it and things like this. Another way to get um, DNA or RNA purified, um, when we're not starting from a gel, if we're starting from some sort of solution or some sort of tissue or something like this, we often use a triazole extraction. Um, so triazole is actually going to allow you to separate DNA, RNA, and proteins. Most commonly you're using it to get the RNA, or at least I am. Um, and so you can do this. This is like a phenyl chloroform extraction. Um, Trizol, it also has guanidium thiocyanate, which is going to, um, which is going to help denature things, um, various things like this. So that's the trizol. It's basically phenyl chloroform extraction with this guanidium thiocyanate. And I have a whole post on this. When you're doing a purification, there's often going to, even if you start with one of these more manual um, intensive methods like a crush and soak or like a trizol extraction, um, like a precipitation, there's often going to be some sort of spin column, um, a method where you have some sort of purification um, using a column. And these columns basically have this membrane and then you use different buffers, so different solutions to try to get the RNA or the DNA to bind to the column and be able to wash other stuff off um, and then change the conditions so that the DNA or the RNA come off the column and come through. Um, and so there are various kits for this um, and this can help you like get rid of some of that excess salt. It can help you concentrate things because you have everything stuck on the membrane while, while you wash everything else off. And then you can kind of decide how much volume you want to elute your sample in. Um, so do you want it to be really concentrated? In the case that in case you can use one of these like cleaning concentrator columns where you can elute it in a very small volume of liquid. Or you can elute it in a larger volume if you want um, to make sure you get everything, but you don't care how, it, how concentrated it is. Speaking of concentration, you want to be able to measure that concentration and how we often measure this is with um, spectroscopy. Um, using the UV260 is where we typically measure nucleic acids. It's going to give us the most specific information about um, like the most, that's where nucleic acids absorb the strongest and there's also less absorbance from other molecules there. And so if we have pure nucleic acid, we can then measure the 200, the um, absorbance at 260 nanomoles, nanometers, and then use Beer's Law to convert this to the concentration. And so I have a post on that as well. So we're often using some sort of, this is commonly done with like a nano drop, which isn't, isn't that um, completely accurate, especially if the concentrations are low, but it's nice and quick and easy. You can also use a spectrophotometer or a, like a fluorescence tool, like a qubit. Sometimes we want to be able to track nucleic acids and so we can radio label them. We add a radioactive phosphate group onto their end and this is going to allow us to then track them. Um, in order to do this labeling reaction, we often use like a polynucleotide ty kinase or PNK. And then to remove the excess, um, the excess like ADKB, 
we use these like desalting and buffer exchange columns. We can also use similar columns when we're purifying things like proteins. These are really great for getting rid of salts. Basically, the little th these um, these columns have these pores in them, and so the little things are going to be able to get into the pores, and they're going to get stuck in the pores. Whereas the bigger things are going to go around them. So all those salts and that ATP and stuff is going to get stuck in the pores of these beads. And then your protein or your nucleic acid is going to flow through. Um, and then you can capture it. Um, so those are these like desalting columns. These something like a G25 or G50 or PD10. Um, that's how these things work. And they're often like based and done in spin columns. Or they have like gravity flow ones. Okay. Um, what else can you do with nucleic acids? You can sequence them, um, or at least a company can sequence them, and you can give them your samples for them to sequence. Some of the common methods include Sanger sequencing, which is lower, um, like lower throughput. You're looking for a specific sequencing. We often do this when we're um, checking the sequence of our clones and things like this. Although nowadays, um, we can also do whole plasmid um, sequencing, which is getting a lot um, cheaper. Um, and it can be a really great option because you don't have to use specific primers and things. Uh, but anyway, um, there's also like Illumina sequencing, um, which can give you short reads. Um, there's also tools that can give you longer reads, like PacBio and Nanopore. Um, or more on this in other posts. So a company might be doing that for you, but what you're often doing yourself is PCR. You do PCR a lot in the lab. Um, often, and so this is basically your, it allows you to copy specific regions of DNA using um, primers that are basically short pieces of DNA that are going to tell the copying machinery, the DNA polymerase, where to start and stop making, um, where the region like you want copied is. And so kind of like bookend it, you'll make these primers that kind of bookend that region that you want copied. Um, and then you stick you mix these with your sample and you stick in DNA polymerase and you stick it in a machine and basically it'll make a lot of copies of that sequence. Um, and so I have much more on PCR and various um, technical considerations to making your PCR reaction happy and working. Um, one specialized type of PCR that you're often using is qPCR um, or quantitative PCR and often what you're doing is you're using RT qPCR so reverse transcription qPCR, um, sometimes RT also can scan for real time um, because basically what you're doing is you're going to be measuring the, um, the copy making in real time. And what you're doing is you're using primers that are going to, that are looking for a specific sequence. And remember those primers are going to be the things that are going to target the target where DNA polymerase goes and makes copies. And so the primer has to bind to the thing that you're, that you're trying to make a copy of. And if that thing that you're trying to make a copy of isn't present, you're not going to get a signal. And if it's present at low levels, you're going to get a low signal. And if it's present at high levels, you're going to get a high signal. And so qPCR is going to allow you to detect how many copies of the sequence there are present. Um, basically how it works is each cycle of PCR, you get a duplication. Um, and so it, every, the amount of the sequence you have is going to double. And in qPCR, you can measure the doubling based on measuring how much um, double-stranded DNA is made or by measuring the binding of a specific probe, um, a reporter probe. And basically the, hot, the signal is going to rise faster if you start with more. And then you measure where, the, where you reach a certain threshold. And the more copies you start with, the faster you'll reach the threshold. So QB, RTQBCR is going to be al allow you to measure copies of the sequence. And often what you're measuring is copies of a messenger RNA. And we use this as a way to measure expression. So we can mean different things when we say expression. We can talk about because the making of a protein is going to depend on the transcription, so whether or not how, and how many messenger RNA copies are made, then translation, how, many, um, how much those messenger RNAs are used to make protein. And it's also going to depend on things like messenger RNA decay. So you might be making a certain amount, but how, much, how long is that messenger RNA hanging around? Um, if you have things like microRNA or other RNAi, this can be influencing that. If you have other um, decay factors that could be influencing that. So your messenger RNA levels are going to depend on pre-transcription as well as post-transcriptional regulation. 
and your protein, how much protein you have is going to depend on how much gets made as well as how much gets degraded. So if we want to measure, we can measure expression based, we can mean different things when we say expression, and we can use different techniques to measure the expression at these different levels. So if we want to directly measure the transcription, you can use a tool like Paul 2 ChipSeq, which is going to look and see where RNA polymerase is bound. So it's basically going to take the sites that RNA was bound, polymerase was bound to, and you sequence them and see where those sites were. If you want to look at messenger RNA levels, well, we talked about how we could look use RTQPCR. Kind of similarly to blots, this is going to tell you about a specific sequence, but only if you look for it. And remember, you can also use the northern blot to look for specific sequences. Um, if you want to look for multiple different specific sequences, there are things like microarrays, which are kind of like a bunch of northern blots on a plate. Um, and then if you want to look for all the messenger RNAs, you can use like RNA sequencing, where basically you can sequence all of the messenger RNAs. And there are various things you can do, like you can um, amplify, you can um, enrich for the messenger RNAs using like a poly T um, primer, or there's various random methods, um, random primer methods, and I get into that in other posts. Um, but basically, so you can measure all of the RNA levels, and this is going to tell you about how many copies of each there was. What, how do we measure that translation? Well, there are various methods, including polysome profiling and ribosome sequencing. So ribosome, some riboseq, or some is called ribosome profiling, um, or ribosome footprinting. Um, basically, these are going to allow you those Ribosome sequencing or ribosome footprinting, basically this is going to look and see where ribosomes are bound on various sequences. And you can look and see how many ribosomes are bound to specific sequences and where those ribosomes were bound on those sequences. You can also use polysome profiling. Basically a polysome is when you have multiple ribosomes translating the same messenger RNA at the same time. And often the more highly, um, highly expressed proteins the ones that are getting made more proteins made of, in addition to having more messenger RNAs, those messenger RNAs typically have more ribosomes on them. So they're going to be enriched in these polysome fractions. And so you can then look and see how many, um, whether the whether your a transcript of interest was enriched in that fra polysome fraction. So various methods to, to study what's actually actively getting made. But remember that the so that remember that's going to depend on the transcription as well as the degradation. If you want to measure how many proteins are present, um, then you can use like mass spectrometry, um, which is going to tell you about all the proteins. It basically chops the pieces up, chops the proteins up into pieces, and then measures um, the mass to charge ratio of those pieces, um, which is going to then be compared to a database to identify where those pieces were coming from and tell you about the levels of the various proteins. And then we have the Western blot, which can look for specific proteins. And so the measure, the, the amount of protein is going to depend on how much was made, so the translation, as well as how much was degraded. And we already talked about how we can use like Western blots and other sorts of blots to look for specific molecules. I mean, one other thing I want to mention, um, I wasn't sure where to put this, but basically we can use different types of luminescence um, in various reporters. Um, luminescence refers to when a molecule gives off light. Um, so when mo molecules give off light, when um, they have electrons excited and then those excited electrons kind of get bored, as I like to say, they kind of um, can't stay excited forever and then they have to release the energy that excited them. And this is called luminescence. And the excitation energy, so what made that electron excited, that energy can come from light, in which case we call this fluorescence, or it can come from a chemical reaction, in which case we call it chemiluminescence. Um, there are also times where an electron can get excited, um, but would normally get excited, but if there's a molecule really close to it, it can kind of have that excitation energy be stolen by like a quencher and so you can get things like quench fluorescence and you can get things like fret um, where the fluorophore and the quencher are close you're going to not see a signal and when they're far apart 
you're going to see a signal. And so this can be used to kind of detect whether proteins are interacting, how close proteins are, or not just proteins, but like proteins and nucleic acids, um, various things like this. And so lots of different um, tools rely on luminescence. So we talked about measuring expression, but how do we actually go about manipulating that expression or manipulating other things? So when we're talking about actually manipulating, um, we're typically dealing with reverse genetics techniques. So with reverse genetics, what we're basically doing is we're changing something about, um, we're changing the genetics um, in order to observe changes to the phenotype. So we're changing the genotype and looking to see what the effects are, what is the like phenotype. Um, and so we can do this at various levels. If we're actually talking about genetics, genetics, we'd be dealing with the gene. Um, and so we'd have to do some gene editing. So we're editing like the permanent version. And to do gene editing, what's often done is like using CRISPR-Cas systems, or nowadays there's also like prime editing. CRISPR is really great, especially for knocking out genes. So if you want to kind of really mess up a gene so that it can't be used, Basically, uh, CRISPR-Cas systems, you can program it with an RNA that's going to get this, these molecular scissors to kind of go and find that the matching DNA sequence and cut it. And when it gets cut, then the cells try to fix it. Um, and so if you give them a sequence that they can put in its place, you can get gene editing. And if you don't give it a sequence, then the cells will kind of try to fix it themselves and if they don't do it right, um, then you will get errors that are going to make the, so that the protein can't get made from it. Um, there are various caveats and these have to be designed um, really carefully and thoroughly tested, make sure there's no off target effects, um, various things like this. Um, but the CRISPR-Cas system is very powerful. Although there's certain things that it's not great for and so there's other techniques like prime editing um, and lots of others of other um, variations that are commonly being um, more and more um, is coming out. That's messing with the actual gene. And so if you actually genetic knockout is where you basically make it so that it can't be used and you don't get the protein made ever. So it's like a, this is whenever we're talking about CRISPR, we're dealing with the gene level, we're dealing with the DNA. So these changes are going to be permanent. And every cell that comes from that modified cell is going to be mutated. If we just want to do things temporarily, what we can do is we can, instead of targeting the DNA, we can target the messenger RNA copies. A way that we can do this is using RNA interference or RNAi. Basically here, we're use, still using small RNAs. We're using these RNA guides, but we're using it to target different machinery. And this machinery, instead of targeting the DNA, it's going to target the RNA, the messenger RNA, and it's going to um, slice that messenger RNA to keep it from getting made. And so we can use RNA interference in the lab in order to target and degrade specific messenger RNAs using, um, using things like siRNA or small hairpin in RNA, so shRNA, um, things like this. So often siRNA is um, just given um, to these cells, and but you can use you can actually have the cells also express, um, so make themselves like hairpin RNAs that can then get processed into siRNAs, which get used by the protein. If you want like a longer lasting, I um, mean not have to just keep adding the siRNA. But this is going to be affecting the the trend, the um, the messenger RNA and not the actual gene. Um, another way we can actually like manipulate genes and things is with Crelox or combination. And here we're typically dealing with something that's already been manipulated. So either you you've used CRISPR to um, to edit the actual gene in place, endogenous, or what you've done is you have a plasmid that you've added extra into there. And so you have some sort of um, clone, genetically manipulated already piece of G DNA, such as like a circular plasmid that you put into these cells. And you were able to then manipulate more easily the sequences in that plasmid. And so here you're not dealing with the endogenous sequence, but you're dealing with an exogenous sequence. Um, so something that you added. But what you do is you can add these um, recombination sites on either side of a gene of interest, say. And so you can add these recombination sites either endogenously or in the plasmid or some other form. And then what you do is when you 
add a certain chemical, you can get it. Or when you add a when you add a recombination protein, it can basically get regions to swap, um, or it can get regions to flip. Um, you can use various modified versions like flex recombination in order to get things to permanently um, be removed. Um, basically, it's going to allow you to change when a certain gene gets made, um, flip on, like turn, kind of turn on genes or turn off genes at the level of the DNA. And there are various methods to do this in like specific cell types, so you can label cell types. There's a lot of really, um, really cool work that goes on. I just don't do it myself. That was dealing with the DNA, and we talked about how we could deal with the messenger RNA. The other type um, place we can mess with things is the protein. Um, so if we want, there are these molecules called Protax, um, proteolysis targeting chimeras. And these are actually a big up and coming field in drug discovery um, and treatment. And there are some, basically what these are is there are these protein, these molecules that are going to manipulate the cellular machinery that is responsible for degrading proteins. So we have this system in our cell called the proteasome um, and, or the ubiquitin proteasome system, uh, basically molecules for targeted for degradation will get tagged with this protein called ubiquitin. They'll get this ubiquitin linked onto it, and that ubiquitin will kind of serve as a tag that's going to give it a ticket to the proteasome, which is the protein shredder. So this ubiquitin is going to allow those, um, allow those proteins to get stuck to the proteasome, and then the proteasome is going to chew them up. And so if you can get the molecules that do this ubiquitination are called ubiquitin ligases, and if you can get these ubiquitin ligases to target a protein you want degraded, then the ubiquitin ligase will, will um, ubiquitinate that protein and then that protein will get degraded. And so protax are a way that you can basically, they have these, two, these molecules with these two parts, they're bifunctional. One part is going to bind to that ubiquitin ligase and the other part is going to bind to the protein of interest. This brings them together and therefore you can get your protein degraded. There are also molecular glues, which basically they're very similar, except that instead of having these two parts where one part targets the E3, um, and this is kind of like generic, or the, the ubiquitin ligase, and this part's kind of like generic for, for that ubiquitin ligase, and then the other part is specific for your protein. So you can use that same ubiquitin ligase targeting part with different proteins, um, with different protein targeting parts. In a molecular glue, you kind of have a single molecule that's going to interact with both of these. Now, these are going to be harder to find. Or, I mean, this is still a single molecule, but it's two parts. On um, the molecular glue, it's kind of like one part. Um, and it's not like you can just swap out part um, that, like for different proteins. It's a specific interaction between both of them. It kind of brings them together um, in a unique way. Um, that, so that's a protac. There's also conditional degron tags. So basically what happens here is that you have a tag that's cloned onto the end of a protein. So here you will happen to do some genetic manipulation first. And often this is going to be with a protein that's, say, expressed from a plasmid. If you, um, this is going to, the conditional, the, so the sequence that you put on is, like, it's called a conditional degron. A degron is the sequence that a ubiquitin ligase is going to recognize. And a conditional degron tag is basically, it's only going to serve as a degron if there's a chem certain chemical present. Um, and so when you add that chemical, now it's going to act as a degron. It's going to recruit the ligase, and therefore it's going to get um, ubiquitinated and degraded. And this can allow you to, on demand, degrade a specific protein. Um, and they're more flexible and easier to design um, because you can stick that degron onto any protein and then like kind of automatically have this, have this system in place, this, this molecule that's going to target them um, and induce this binding for any protein with this tag. Whereas for here, you had to kind of find the right, the right um, protein targeting molecule. Whereas here and here, basically all the, all the proteins are going to have that same targeting molecule so you can use the same degradation strategy. But you have to clone the sequence so that it has that actual tag on it. But that's a conditional degron tag. 
This includes like an oxygen inducible Degron tag or a D tag, things like this. Okay, moving on. Detecting and measuring interactions. So I have a whole post on methods to study protein protein and protein nucleic acid interactions and kind of like how to choose and what to what, what there are. Some of these methods are actually going to be cross-linking the the DNA and the protein or the RNA or the protein or the protein, the protein, basically with cross-linking using formaldehyde or something like this, you're permanently sticking together those mo interacting molecules. So when molecules are interacting, they're normally doing so like non-covalently. So it's kind of like this reversible binding. And this can make it, if depending on how strong that binding is, it might make it so that we can't really detect the interaction because it's too weak and they're falling apart as we're trying to measure them. Um, and so if we stick them strongly in place, then we can then be able to really detect that they were interacting. Um, although we have to be careful that we're not just detecting really transient interactions because once you stick it in place, you can't tell was it stuck really strongly or really weakly. But once it's stuck in place, you can actually then look and see where they were interacting. And so in the case of a protein nucleic acid interaction, you can isolate the protein and then um, sequence what it was bound to. And this is the basic idea of like a chip seek or a rip seek. With chip seek, we're looking at like chromatin and basically um, chromatin is where DNA is really tightly wound up. Um, it can be wound up around these like histone proteins and we can look and see the regions that are really wound up, these are gonna be less, less used regions because they, if they're actively being used, they can't be wound up too tight or else the DNA polymer or the RNA polymerase isn't gonna have access to them. And so the regions that are looser goosey, loosey goosey, they're going to be able to be expressed more. And so you can use ChIP-seq to kind of see which regions have more or less, um, less more or less of these like tightly folded regions and see kind of an idea about what's getting used um, as various things like this. RIP-seq, um, this is looking starting with RNA uh, or looking at RNA instead of DNA. And there are a bunch of different variations. Another way we can um, tell whether things are interacting is a co-IP or co-immunoprecipitation. Basically you're using antibodies to um, pull out um, a certain protein of interest and then look and see what it's bound to. Um, often we have this antibodies conjugated or attached to these beads, um, commonly magnetic beads. This is going to allow us to isolate the protein that's bound to the antibody um, as well as whatever it's bound to, wash off the stuff that's not bound, and then unbind our protein from the antibody and see what it was hanging out with, such as with the Western blot or with mass spectrometry. This is an example of a pull down. There are different types of pull down where basically it's the same sort of strategy, but instead of using an antibody to target a protein, you're using something um, like an affinity, some sort of affinity tag strategy like GST and glutathione, or you can use biotin and this tryptavidin. Same sort of idea, except you're not using an antibody, but you're capturing one molecule, seeing um, with whatever it's bound to, washing off what it's not bound to, and then looking to see what the molecule was bound to. Another way we can detect interactions is um, often DNA protein interactions is using an EMSA. So here you radio label your DNA or your RNA, um, and then you mix it with various concentrations. Um, um, so, so basically you mix it with um, various concentrations of your protein. The, if they're interacting, then the DNA, and then you run a gel and look to see where that labeled DNA or RNA was. If it was bound to the protein, it'll be higher up in the gel because it'll be slowed down by the protein. But if it wasn't bound to the protein, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lower down in your gel. And so then you can measure how much of it is shifted. So how much of it is bound to that protein and therefore traveling more slowly through the gel versus how much of it is just like free floating. And so then this is going to allow you to kind of determine how strong the binding is, as well as whether or not they're binding in the first place. There's also slot blotting. I did this a ton in my graduate studies. Basically here, instead of separating using a gel, you're separating using this like vacuum filtration apparatus where you have these two membranes. 
on the top, you have a membrane, a nitrocellulose, mem nitrocellulose membrane that's going to bind proteins and whatever nucleic acid it's bound to. And then an nylon membrane that's going to bind the RNA or the DNA. Um, and then basically you flow this mixture through and the protein and whatever stuck to it is going to get stuck on top. Um, whatever flows through is going to get stuck on bottom. And then you can measure the relative amounts on these. So instead of looking at upper and lower bands, we're looking at upper and lower membranes. Another cool way that, um, to look at interactions is this like phase, phage display. And with phage display, you're kind of able to over to like evolve sequences that are going to bind better um, to evolve like proteins that are going to bind better to a specific molecule. And this is commonly used to just to make like more fine antibodies and things like this. Um, it uses the strategy where you basically stick the genetic instructions for making a protein into a phage, so a bacteria infecting virus such that the phage will display it. It'll actually put this, display this sequence or this protein. So make this protein and put it on the end of one of these proteins that's sticking off of the phage. And then you have this, so it's going to be associated, the phage is going to have the DNA for making that protein. And then the protein is going to get made and showed on the surface. Then you take a bunch of the bunch, bunch of these phages. So you have this whole like phage library where each one has a different sequence. And you see if they can bind to a molecule that you want to find the binders for um, that's like stuck on a plate. Um, and so it's immobilized. You flow these phages on over it. The ones that have a protein that will stick to the molecule are going to stick. You wash everything else off and then you look and you actually can sequence the ones that stuck to figure out what the sequence was there. Um, and then you can do this over and over to kind of enrich for the ones that were the strongest binders. You can use mutagenesis and things like this to try to evolve um, even stronger binders. Um, and so phage display is really, really cool. There's also a lot of like biophysical techniques that I don't have dedicated posts on. These include SBR or surface plasmon resonance. This detects interactions with molecules stuck on a chip. So you have one molecule stuck on a chip. Um, this can be through like a biotin strep gavidin or something like this. You flow a mixture containing another molecule over that, and then the machine kind of measures how the interaction, like what's happening at the surface of that chip, where the molecule is bound. If another molecule binds, it'll be detected. ITC, um, isothermal calorimetry, measures tiny changes in temperature caused by binding interactions. And then there are a variety of single molecule methods that use high fl resolution fluorescence microscopy or other techniques like force space techniques. Um, you might see things like molecular tweezers and things like this um, in order to measure interactions. Some of the most fundamental methods that you're going to be using in, in biochemistry are less exciting, but not less important. And they're some of the first experiments that you're probably going to be learning. This involves a lot of molecular cloning. So molecular cloning, you're taking a segment of DNA from a tome and sticking it into a piece of DNA that's easier to work with. And commonly this piece of DNA we're sticking it into is going to be a plasmid. Um, a plasmid is going to be a circular piece of DNA and we have like what we call like a plasmid vector. Basically a vector is a vehicle. So if we can use this plasmid as a vehicle for getting our DNA um, into cells of interest. Um, and so this can commonly be bacterial cells, um, but there are also other types of cells you can put your plasmids into depending on the plasmid. Um, so I have a post on how you can like choose plasmid vectors. When we talk about subcloning, this is basically when we're taking a sequence that's already in one clone and sticking it in one plasmid and sticking it in another plasmid, which is getting more and more common these days. So you can have various vectors, vector plasmids that are going to allow it to get into different cells or um, be expressed in different times, things like this. There are various cloning strategies. Um, the type I use is slick sequence and ligation independent cloning. It's a PCR based method. You make lots of copies of the parts you want to mix, uh, make them so that they have overlapping regions, and then I'll put them and mix them together and allow bacteria to heal them up. The conventional um, cloning uses like restriction enzymes. So basically um, they have restriction sites on either side of the region that you want to be um, cut out and put into the plasmid. And then you cut the plasmid with those same restriction enzymes or, or complementary ones. 
Um, basically, you make it so these pieces have matching sticky ends, and those sticky ends are going to stick together. You add a DNA ligase, which is going to stitch them together, and then you stick it into the cells. With Slick, basically what you're doing is you're making copies, and instead of putting them, um, in, you know, chewing back the ends a little to make to make ends that aren't aren't sticky for one another, but they have a little bit of overlap. And then you put it in bacteria, and the bacteria is actually going to do the stitching for you. So I really like Slick, um, and I have a post on it. But the restriction enzyme is more common, and I have posts on that as well. In addition to just moving sequences from one place to another, sometimes what we want to do is we just want to like take the sequence that's already there and change it. We can do this with site-directed mutagenesis. Um, again, using like Slick or with Quick Change, various things like this. And this is going to make it, allow us to make specific changes. And I mentioned with, with all of this, we're dealing just with like plasmids. We're dealing with things in a test tube um, that we stick in bacteria, say. We're not dealing with actual genetic DNA that is in that is in like human cells or anything like this. That's going to be a lot harder. So we can't just do this to make changes in DNA that's in our cells. But we can do this in a test tube in DNA that's in a plasmid. So just important to keep in mind, we're actually sticking this plasmid, say, um, into a PCR machine and getting lots of copies of it made. And that's not something that you can do with cells. But since we can do it in like this in vitro method, it can be really, really helpful to allow us to study, say, what specific parts of proteins do by changing the sequence of the DNA to change the sequence of the protein and how that protein um, is made and things like this. So we can learn a lot from these in vitro methods. So as I mentioned, we're often sticking this plasmid into bacteria, and we only want, we want to use this bacteria to make lots of copies of the plasmid for us, and we only want the bacteria to be able to, and we want to make sure that we're only kind of like feeding the bacteria that actually have the plasmid. So the process of putting that plasmid into bacteria is called transformation. It's a form of transfection. So transfection is basically where we stick genetic info into cells. If we're doing it into bacteria, we call it transformation. When a virus does it, we call it transduction. And then all the rest of the time, we just call it transfection. But when we're doing it in bacteria, we call it transformation. Basically, we stick the plasmid into bacterial cells. Um, and often this is done with heat shock and chemically competent cells. So we take these cells that are weak, these bacteria that are weakened, um, and they're coated in calcium, which is going to kind of neutralize their negatively charged and the negatively charged membrane. Um, and this is going to, and the negatively charged DNA, allow them to get close. You um, heat shock them, you stick them in a water bath that's warm for like 40 seconds or so. Um, this is gonna kind of open up pores in the bacterial membrane that the DNA can then sneak in. Um, now the, DNA, the, plas the bacteria is taken in your plasmid um, and it can make copies of it. But you only want to make, you want to make sure that only the bacteria that actually took in the plasmid are going to be able to survive. Um, and so what you can do is on your plasmid, you often have a selection marker that's an antibacterial resistance gene. And then you grow the cells in the presence of the corresponding antibiotic. And only the bacteria, only the bacteria that have taken in the plasmid will be able to make the resistance on um, the needed resistance product, and therefore only they will be able to survive. And so this allows us to use antibiotic-based selection. And I have much more on that. That tells you that the bacteria took in the, in the plasmid, but not that the plasmid was actually cloned correctly. And there are various strategies that we can use to kind of see if it was cloned correctly. The only true way is going to be with sequencing, um, but there are kind of checks along the way that can kind of prioritize which ones you want to send for sequencing, and you want to make sure that you're kind of weeding out the bad ones. Selection was going to basically tell us, with selection, you're saying only allow things to grow or survive if they have a various property. There are also screening methods where here you're saying, okay, they can live, but um, show me whether or not they're right. And so blue-white screening, how it works is you actually stick your insert into um, a gene that's needed to make a blue product. Um, and so when you 
stick your gene in, if you've successfully got an insert in there, then it's going to, it's you're going to strip that blue maker, you're going to disrupt that blue making um, pr protein, and therefore you're going to get your colony won't turn blue when you add this chemical, in or you grow the the um, cells on this plate with this chemical, and so you'll get this like white colony instead of a blue colony. So that's going to tell you that your insert was in there, but it still doesn't tell you whether that insert was correct. To see if the insert was correct, there are some kind of quick checks that you can use, like colony PCR. Basically, you're trying to use PCR to figure out whether a sequence was, was present. Um, and the size of the pieces is going to tell you about, um, or in the, whether or not you get a product, as well as the size of the product, is going to tell you about whether the sequence was present. And you can actually do this directly from the colony. So take a little bit of the colony, swirl it around in some PCR mix and run PCR without having to actually go through a mini prep, which is where you purify out the plasmid. Um, if you purify out the plasmid, you can use um, analytical or restriction enzyme digests. Basically here, you're looking to see whether a certain sequence is present by using restriction enzymes that will cut the sequence if it's present, or it'll cut somewhere else in the plasmid. But based on the size and number of pieces, you can tell whether the insert was in there. But this doesn't tell you if there's any typos or anything like that, and so you always want to send your clone, your clone, your um, PCR, your cell, your plasmid for sequencing. So you can either do like Sanger sequencing, where you give them primers, or you use primers that are these comp these plasmids often have. Um, like common primers um, sites on around your inserts that the companies will just add for you, or you can use a custom primer. Um, and more on that in the other post. Um, but basically, you can use Sanger sequencing, which is that kind of really specific um, sequencing, or you can do things like whole plasmid sequencing and just have them sequence the whole plasmid. You should also send your plasma for sequencing when you get uh, when you order a plasmid. It'll often come in like a bacterial stab, um, where basically it'll have, they'll take a pipette and um, stick it in their bacterial culture that has the plasmid growing, and then they stab it into this agar. So kind of like when you had the um, those petri dishes, except that this is in a tube. And then you get this tube, and what you do is you take this, you take a little, um, one of those inoculation loops or whatever, and then you streak, you stick it into that stab hole, and then you streak your plate um, to try to get these individual colonies, and then you can grow those colonies up, mini prep them out, mini prep the plasmid out of them, um, and sequence it, as well as now you have a purified plasmid. Um, but you always want to check the sequence, um, because sometimes they can be wrong, um, and it's always great to double check. We talked a little bit about, a little bit about before about how we can measure nucleic acid concentration using Beer's law and spectroscopy, measuring the absorbance at 260. If we measure at 280, we can get an idea about protein absorption. But note that if you have like DNA or RNA contamination, that's going to also influence your ratios. You can use a more protein specific method. Um, so that's going to be great if you have purified protein and you can use the specific and uh, extinction coefficient that you can get from like Xpazy prop param and more on that in another post. But there are a lot of other ways to measure protein concentration as well, including dye-based methods like Bradford um, or fluorescent dyes, as well as methods like BCA and Lowry. Um, and yeah, so more on that in this post. With any of these experiments, you're going to have to keep some things in mind. One is what type of experimental system you're using. So this can be anything from in vitro to in vivo. So in vitro, this is like in a cell tube, in a tube, or in a like purified mixture. You're just going to have the most control, but the least realistic. And then on the other end, you have in vivo, where basically you're inside of an animal, or inside of a bacteria, or yeast if there's a single cell. Um, but you're going to have the least control, it's, but it's going to be the most realistic. And then you have things that are in between. So with in vitro, you can kind of like have things super duper reconstituted. So you're using totally purified components, which is really great for dissecting mechanisms. So like, how do things work? Um, but you can be missing components that then you don't even know that you're missing. And so you might get a less accurate um, 
idea. But if you have a good idea of what's going on already, this is really good for that like fine dissection of what's happening at the molecular level. A lysate based is the, kind of like the next step up in terms of realism. Um, so you have less control here, but more control than you'd have in cells or in vivo. Um, but you're you're adding components that you're not exactly sure about. So you don't have control over the concentrations of everything in that lysate, but you can take that lysate and you can then manipulate other factors. Um, in cell culture, um, basically here you have a medium level of control and realism, more variability. Um, sometimes people refer to it as in vivo, but if you're working with single cells, it's only really in vivo if you're working with bacteria or yeast or something like that. Um, and so in cell culture, um, cell culture is like different than in vivo um, and cells culture can have various artifacts and things like this and often you're working in cell lines that are like cancer cell lines and things like this that have a bunch of mutations. Um, and when you're working with cells like stuck to a plate or something, they're missing a lot of the context. You can get some more context with like things like organoids as well as like tissues. Um, and, but if you want, really want the most, um, the most physiologically relevant, the most bodily relevant, uh, the most realistic, then you're in vivo. So this is like inside of organisms. But of course, then this is going to have to be a lot more complicated. And if you're working with like a model organism, like a mouse or something, are those findings then directly relevant to, say, a human? Um, so th lots of things to think about when you're setting up your experiment. Um, it's including how you actually go about designing your experiment. How do you, what do you remember to keep your controls, your positive controls? So if you're, if you get like a negative result, no signal or something, is that because you're, that's actually the finding that the protein wasn't present, that the DNA wasn't present, that the gene wasn't important, or is it because the experimental system wasn't able to detect it because there was something wrong with your experiment? So you need a positive control and you also need a negative control. So if, if you're seeing a signal, is that because there's actually a signal there or is it because there's some sort of background or other artifact that's causing that? So you need those controls and then you need to basically control as much as possible so that you're only, you have your, um, the things that you aren't measuring aren't going to be differing and therefore interact, inter inter um, Interrupting what you're trying to measure. So you want to measure the dependent variable. These are the things that you want to measure changes in and you want to control for the independent variables. Those things that you're not really caring about, but might affect the interaction. And so by controlling for those independent variables, you can then um, be sure that the only thing that's different is going to be the thing that you're measuring. Okay, we already talked about kind of um, reverse genetics. For genetics is basically where you start from the phenotype. So you identify some sort of um, quality or phenomenon or something like this, and then you want to see how it, what caused it. Um, yeah, we also talked a little bit about preparative versus analytical techniques, how we can do things at like a small scale this to just get a look. So like analytical, see whether things are interacting how big a molecule is, see, um, did your cloning work, that sort of thing. Whereas preparative here, you're looking, you're trying to basically use all of your sample as a purification step. So you might be using size exclusion chromatography. Um, in the case of a preparative, you'd be doing it to purify the proteins. In the case of analytical, you're just trying to like see if they interact and stuff. Um, and in the case of gel electrophoresis, here you might be doing something like uh, one of those gel extractions we talked about. Um, and then also with, I have a bunch of notes on how do you, some kind of like basic strategies to think about when you're planning experiments and when you're actually performing them. In terms of structural biology, so as I mentioned, I have that whole page of structural biology posts, um, but here are some of the key like experimental ones. When we're talking about structural biology, the main two techniques that we use are X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. With X-ray crystallography, what we do is we take a molecule, such as a protein, and we get it to crystallize. And when we say crystallize, basically with protein, they're all kind of freezing in the same orientation over space, um, kind of like a brick wall where each of those bricks is made up of a protein or multiple proteins, um, but each of those bricks is identical. Then you shoot x-rays at that crystal, so at that brick wall. 
And the x-rays are going to interact with the atoms inside of those bricks, so inside of those molecules. And the x-rays are going to get scattered. So these x-rays are waves, um, and when, these, when waves interact with one another, they can either um, add up, so you get constructive interference, or they can um, cancel each other out, destructive interference. Kind of like how if you dropped golf balls in water, you get those ripples, and then you have those high ripples and like the low parts. Similarly, when the x-rays are going to hit the molecules, the, the x-rays are going to get deflective, deflected, and so they're going to get off course, and they're going to interact with one another. And you're going to get, kind of get these ripples, and these ripples are going to get captured on this detector, and you get this pattern of spots called a diffraction pattern. Um, and then we can work backwards from this diffraction pattern in order to figure out the atomic structure of those molecules. It's really hard to get the, the protein to crystal because crystallize, they don't really like to stay still um, in the same position and things. So there are a lot of different techniques that we can use, um, like vapor diffusion, um, various changing the conditions around the protein, um, various concentrations, all sorts of different things like this. And so I have more posts on those. Um, single um, cryo EM is another technique. Um, with cryo EM, instead of actually making these molecules crystallize, you kind of let them hang out how they are, and then you freeze them in place. So you flash freeze them in these grids where you have these really thin layers of ice. They're so thin and so pure, like the ice is like you freeze it so fast that it's vitreous. So it's like glass, but it's water. And you have these molecules kind of all in different orientations in that thin layer. And then you use an electron microscope in order to kind of like take pictures of the molecules in place. And then you average together all of those molecules, molecular pictures in order to get, um, get at the structure. So cryo-EM, um, the technology for it has really advanced over the, in recent years. Um, and it's being able to solve smaller and smaller structures. So originally it could only be good for really big complexes um, and really big proteins. And so it's still really good for really big things. Um, it's better for big things. Um, but the molecule, the, you can also start to get smaller and smaller, um, smaller molecules be able to be processed with this. Extra crystallography is not going to be great for those big things, but you can get higher, you often get higher resolution with crystallography. Um, but you can start, people are starting to get really, really high resolution with cryo-EM as well. But I should say that it's not like it's, it's not easy going. Neither of these are easier going. And it's not like all molecules are going to be giving you this nice cryo-EM structure right away. So both of these techniques are going to be very, very complicated and take a lot of optimization in a lot of cases, in most cases. There are some molecules that are going to be a lot easier to get um, at resolution structures of. Um, so with cryo-EM, you might see people do like um, maple ferritin or whatever. It's like a very stable, big complex that's going to be. Um, so with cryo-EM, you might see people use like maple ferritin or something like this. Cause it's kind of like kind of like your model model structure compound. Um, it's going to be. So when you see really high resolution structures, it's often because it's one of those kind of like simpler molecules. Um, with extra crystallography, it's like lysozyme. It crystallizes really nicely, uh, but when you're actually dealing with your own protein, your own complex, things like this, it often isn't quite so cooperative. Um, so I come from like a structural biology lab, um, and I've seen colleagues struggle lots and lots, as well as I had some of my own struggles trying to get some extra crystallography structures. Um, okay, some kind of complement, another like third technique that I don't really have a post on is NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance. It's basically a molecular MRI. It's a solution phase experiment, so you don't like freeze your samples in place, um, either through crystallization or for, through flash freezing. Um, and so it can work well for small floppy things, but it requires a lot of sample. So really big things, cryo-EM is great. Really small things, NMR is great, especially if those things are floppy and you have a lot of them. Um, another solution phase technique that isn't really structural biology, but it's kind of like complementary to it is HDXMS, hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. Basically, you give your molecules a bath in heavy water, so it's deuterated water. Um, it's a version of water that acts just like water, but it has um, deuterium instead of hydrogen. And basically, that has an extra neutron. It's just a little heavier, um, but it acts basically the same. 
And so what happens then is this, this deuterium, the hydrogens in the protein or in the molecule are going to get it swapped out for deuterium over time. And then you can look and see where, which regions got swapped, how fast. And the more tied up in the structure those regions were, or if they were bound to something, then they're going to be protected from this exchange, this swap out with the deuterium. And so therefore, they're going to have a lower signal. Um, their signal is going to rise slower. Um, so you can, when you chop up the protein and look to see which parts were heavier, um, the parts that were floppier or the parts that were more exposed, the parts that weren't bound to things, these are going to have a higher signal. They're going to be heavier than those other parts. And so you can get an idea about the secondary structure, so about those like helices and plate sheets and things like this, and these beta strands, the strong secondary structure that involves those backbone hydrogens that are going to get swapped out in other cases um, that are then tied up and can't or these regions that are bound to something else, and so they don't have those hydrogens available. Whereas those floppy regions are going to have lots of those backbone um, hydrogens available to swap out and then get heavier quicker. Okay, um, and then some fundamentals. So those are some more specialized techniques, but there's also a bunch of fundamental techniques. And so I have a post on equipment. Um, so everything from your beakers and flasks to cylinders and bottles and centrifuges and pipettes. So I have a whole post on pipettes and kind of based strategies of pipetting and various types of pipettes, um, various centrifuges, um, how we often use them for sedimentation. So just pelleting, spinning things down, um, separating the soluble stuff, the, um, the supernate and the stuff that's still in the liquid um, from the pellets, the solid stuff. Um, we can also use gradient centrifugation, which is more of like a purification step such as like a sucrose gradient, um, separate things based on their density um, and their mass, various things like this. Um, we also often in the lab, you have to do things like make buffers. So pH stabilizing solutions, uh, make stock solutions, which are basically higher concentration versions of something that you want to use. Um, helps you not have to weigh out solids so much. Um, various helpful things. Um, serial dilution, so when you're diluting something over and over and over, um, this can be good if you want to make a range of solutions, some sort of standard curve or something, or if you um, just want to make sure that you aren't having to pipette really tiny volumes. Um, and just a couple other random things like kinase assays, um, which measure phosphorylation and which you can often do with liquid scintillation counting. Um, which is a way to measure radioactiv radioactivity. So if you use like radio labeled ATP, um, then you can detect whether the protein was radio labeled by, by blotting the protein onto this, um, this membrane or this piece of filter paper and washing off the non-bound stuff um, and then measuring the radioactivity by sticking this little piece into, into this scintillation vial of liquid and sticking that in a machine. Um, and so I have a whole post on that. I'm not going to go into the protein expression and purification stuff because this post has already gotten really long. Um, but basically, there are different strategies that we can use in order to express and purify proteins based on the different properties of those proteins. And I have a whole page on this, as well as I have a whole page. Um, I have a whole like YouTube playlist about this. Um, and same for those other pages I showed you before. So I have more, much more structural biology. Um, things about mammalian cell culture, as well as a bunch of random practical lab tips and tricks. And you can find them all, all the video versions on, um, on the YouTube channel, and then all the blog versions on my blog. Um, and you can search if you're looking for something in particular, or check out the Excel spreadsheet. So, hope this helped. And sorry I got so long.